Welcome to the fourth and final episode in a Legendarium series about the history of werewolves. In part four, When the Howling Faded, we will talk about Lycanthropy's last hurrah during the 18th century. During the early spring of the year 1603, a reign of terror spread through the St. Sever districts of Gascony in the extreme southwest of France. Young children disappeared from the fields and roads of hamlets and small villages. In one instance, a babe vanished from its cradle. People talked of wolves, while others whispered of something worse. One day, a 13-year-old girl named Marguerite Poirier from the parish of Esperon swore that one midday while she watched cattle, a wild beast, not unlike a huge dog, rushed from the thicket and tore her kirtle with its sharp teeth. She only saved herself from being bitten thanks to a stout, iron-pointed staff which she used to drive off the wolf. Meanwhile, a boy of 13 or 14 years named Jean Grenier took to howling like a wolf and boasting that he had attacked local girls. Yet in a reminder that compassion and wisdom exist even in dark times, the local bishop interviewed Jean Grenier and soon realized that he was not a werewolf, but mentally handicapped. Rather than kill him as happened to many other suspected werewolves, the local bishop sent young Jean to live out his days in a monastery. Although werewolf trials began in Switzerland and France, they occurred more frequently and persisted longer in southern Germany and Austria. They partially resulted from trials of suspected wolf siegen, or wolf charmers. These wolf charmers supposedly used magic to turn wolves into their familiars, and they then used them to attack their enemies. Like witches, wolf charmers went on trial and often marched to the execution dock. In Austria, many witch and werewolf trials occurred at Musha Castle, today a tourist attraction. Built in the 13th century by the Prince Bishop of Salzburg, Musham earned the title Witch's Castle. From 1517 to 1717, an unknown beast killed several cattle and deer at Musham Castle. The castle owners sent out armed hunters, but when they failed, people returned to superstition to explain these events. In 1717, the authorities arrested several beggars and tortured them into giving confessions, which were almost certainly false. They claimed to have received a black cream from Satan, which allowed them to transform into wolves. Once in this state, they killed and ate livestock. Of course, the guilty parties went to the execution dock. Werewolf hysteria largely petered out by the end of the 18th century, as empirical science pioneered by Isaac Newton called such legends into doubt. Yet there would be one more werewolf tale to tell. Between the years 1764 and 1767, a large wolf or a group of wolves terrorized the French province of Gévaudan at the height of werewolf hysteria. The first recorded attack of the beast occurred on June 30th, 1764, when a 14-year-old shepherd named Joan Boulet died while tending a flock of sheep. Locals believed that a demonic werewolf caused their woes. On October 8th, 1764, only hours after another mauling, hunters followed a beast into the estate woods of Chateau de la Bon and shot a volley of musket fire into the creature. After a fall, the beast rose and ran off. The beast moved into Suisson, northeast of Paris, in 1765, and then Perigord in February 1766. In the latter community, the local men organized a hunting party that effectively killed off the region's wolf population. In one case, an old man used a billhook blade to fend off an attacking wolf. Eyewitness accounts of the Gévaudan beast described it as being 
as large as a horse with a panther-like tail. Some eyewitnesses described its fur as being reddish-gray, while others insisted that it had stripes. As fear spread, King Louis XV sent a party of royal hunters who sought a 6,000 livre bounty. They shot a large wolf, but the attacks continued. They continued until 1767. A nobleman named the Marquis de Apacher organized the local militia for a hunt in early June 1767. On June 19th, one of the hunters, an innkeeper named Jean Chastel, shot a wolf on the slopes of Mount Mouchet. Chastel loaded his musket with bullets made from a silver chalice blessed by a priest. He believed that the bullets proved fatal because they had been made from a cup that held the blood of Christ during communion. Its being silver likely made no difference to him, but this legend may be the source of the modern werewolf's weakness to silver bullets. The case still intrigues historians and cryptozoologists to this day. Some claim the beast to be a rabid wolf or a hyena that escaped from a royal zoo. Could a serial killer have disguised himself as a beast? Indeed, scientists struggle to explain the pervasive belief in werewolves. They have suggested ergot fungus in rye bread and disfiguring diseases such as porophyra. Yet such things are not pervasive enough to explain continent-spanning lore. With the coming of the modern age, werewolves moved into the world of literature as fewer took the old myths seriously. Yet because of the 18th century hysteria, gothic horror stories involving monsters became popular in the 19th century. One such novel is Sabine Beringa Uld's The Book of Werewolves, published in 1865. Unfortunately for the werewolf, it lacks a singular classic on a par with Dracula to cement it in popular culture, as Bram Stoker did for vampires. Yet werewolves have thrived on the silver screen. The first actor willing to go through the grueling makeup process to create a believable werewolf was Lon Chaney Jr. in the 1941 movie The Wolfman. His legendary transformation scene shocked audiences and pushed werewolves into mainstream culture. The Wolfman became a staple of the Universal Pictures horror movie franchises. Indeed, the film was remade in 2010 as The Wolfman starring Anthony Hopkins, and the events surrounding the Beast of Gévaudan was made into a 2001 French film called The Brotherhood of the Wolf. In this way, the werewolf lives on, still a subject of fascination and horror. That wraps things up for this episode of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed this series. If you did, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.